I'm Angie Kantz, and this is part five of Deep Dive into the Character Evolution of Daryl Dixon from The Walking Dead for post-show recaps. Today I'm going to be talking about Daryl's relationship with Beth and the impact it has on his character. This segment contains spoilers. Spoilers. I told you. Okay? Daryl's relationship with Beth is highly influential on the development of his character. In episode 1 of season 4, 30 Days Without an Accident, we see Beth's total trust in Daryl. When Beth's boyfriend Zack dies on a run, Daryl is the one to tell her. He feels responsible. His hands are stuffed in his pockets, like a teenager caught past curfew. He can't believe she isn't more upset. But like Carl, growing up in this new world has made Beth's coping strategies more evolved. Are you okay? It's tired of losing people, that's all. This is all that matters to her. He's the protector, the strength of the group. She's insisting that he understands that he's valued, that he's the core of the family, and as long as he's still with them, she's okay. After the destruction of the prison, Daryl reverts right back to his survival wild thing persona. Quiet, angry, self-reliant. He's watching out for Beth, keeping her safe, but he's barely acknowledging her, almost as if she is his cargo. The season four episode featuring Daryl and Beth is called Still. Daryl wants to remain motionless, inert. He sits in the trunk of the car for hours, telling Beth to stay still. He's a sharp instrument, nothing more. Nothing but simply surviving matters to him. He's abandoned the dream of finding purpose through other people. Like so many things before him, they have all been torn from his grasp. He's eating his rattlesnake like a caveman, grunting at Beth completely shut down. It's Beth who wants to do something. Beth wants action, movement away and through conflict. What the hell? You brought me back. I'm not staying in this suck-ass camp. Hey. She wants to find survivors, look for booze. She wants to burn the house down. But for Daryl, movement forward led to loss. He wants to stay still, to regress back to what he used to be, to where he knows he can survive. In the golf club house, Daryl actually takes a bag of money and jewels because that's what the old Daryl would have done. With the prison lost, he's falling back into old identities. The only way he knows how to cope with his loss is to go back to what he was before. But if class divides have been used to illustrate Daryl's alienation in the past, the dog trot golf club does this in the extreme. The old Daryl is the guy who would have written Rich Bitch on the zombie mannequin. It could very well have been Joe and the Claimers who Daryl bands up with later who did this. Help me take her down. It don't matter, she's dead. It does matter. Beth tells him to be respectful, that it matters. She is pulling him back again and again to the civilized version of himself. Daryl throws darts at the faces of the club presidents on the wall. He beats up the rich walker, who represents all of society that looks down on him. He's an outsider here, redneck trash. Beth keeps pulling him forward, keeping him moving, pulling him back to prison Daryl. Even when he loses control, he doesn't scare her. She trusts him implicitly. He's the man who wouldn't let Judith go hungry. The man who single-handedly brought down the governor's tank. The man who's kept her safe every day since the prison fell. She's the complete opposite of him, positive, hopeful, the embodiment of purity, beauty, and compassion. And with all that she represents, Beth is showing Daryl that she cares about him no matter what he does. She feels stronger with him, more capable. Daryl's first real moment of connection with Beth is when she's crying over the bottle of peach schnapps. Daryl watches her and realizes that he knows exactly what she's trying to do because he does it every moment of his life. Bury his pain. I ain't gonna have your first drink. Be no damn peach snobs. Daryl is finally willing to move forward. Come on. In total contrast to Beth's upper class, clean golf course world, they moved to Daryl's moonshine shack. His mom was an alcoholic who burned the house down around her. His dad was an abusive monster who used the junk in their house for target practice. Home sweet home. Daryl is incredibly uncomfortable during the I Never game. He feels vulnerable, judged. He's telling her things about himself that embarrasses him, 
that flies in the face of his prison Daryl identity. He prefers to say, I don't know, shrugging like a child caught in a lie. Um, Just say the first thing that pops into your head. I've never been out of Georgia. It's when she assumes that he's been to jail that the game takes a turn. This is the last thing he says as prison Daryl. So what you think of me? After all he's done, she still sees him as a redneck criminal. Oh, I'm gonna take a piss. This really hurts him. Without Rick in the group, does that mean there's nothing left for him but the man he was before? All the day's resentments at the golf course come to a head as he attacks Beth for all the things she had that he didn't. Never eaten frozen yogurt. Never had a pet pony. Never got nothing from Santa Claus. Never relied on anyone for protection before. I don't think I've ever relied on anyone for anything. Daryl. She sees him for who he really is and calls him on all his tough guy antics. She sees through it. She knows how much the people at the prison meant to him. She knows who he is at his core. Under the fear. Under the grief. And she stands firm before him, making him remember the man he is, not the man he used to be. Your dad? He collapses under the weight of responsibility. Maybe, maybe I could have done something. He was the guardian. He was supposed to protect them. Later, Daryl talks about how pointless his life was before. This is the most open and honest conversation we've seen from Daryl. He's terrified to reveal how stupid his life was before the turn. You want to know where I was before all this? There's this idea in The Walking Dead that you become someone only through other people, and that this is directly tied into the definition of survival in the new world. The contrast of being no one, of being valueless, versus having a life worth living in a group, comes up again and again. Nobody. Nothing. Without the group, does he revert back to the nobody he was before? Is he condemned to a life without purpose? The guilt of it lays so heavily on him because it's tied so directly to his self-worth. If he can't protect his people, what good is he? When he's reunited with Rick at the end of season four, Rick explains that it's not Daryl's responsibility to protect them from danger. That isn't the value he provides. Hey, it's not on you. You've been back with us here now. That's everything. We get the feeling that Daryl has waited his whole life for the validation and unconditional acceptance he just received from Rick. You're my brother. Rick and Daryl are the true yin and yang. In the beginning, Daryl is surviving with no humanity, and Rick is having to kill his humanity in order to survive. But when he admits he was nothing but a degenerate before the turn, instead of thinking less of him, Beth wishes she could be like him. She sees how he rose to the challenge of this crisis and became exactly what he needed to be. Daryl doesn't believe that he got away from his past, that he's grown into something else. I didn't. You did. Maybe you gotta keep on reminding me sometimes. No. But Beth knows that he has to do it. She knows that only Daryl can fix Daryl. This is why he picks up the abuse survivor book in season five's Consumed. He's trying to get better for the group, better for Beth. He tells Carol he's trying to start again. You're gonna miss me so bad when I'm gone, Daryl Dixon. They know it's inevitable that he will be the last man standing. Beth can see how easily Daryl got pulled back into thinking this moonshine shack and all its memories are his some value, that this is who he is, that it will always find him again. He wants to go back inside. Again, there's this idea of staying still. But the new world needs movement. It's repeated that you can't stay in one place anymore. You need to adapt. Stagnation leads to death. And movement doesn't scare Beth. Again, she is pushing Daryl forward. We should go inside. We should burn it down. If he can't see that this isn't where he belongs, then they need to burn it down so he has no choice but to move on. Daryl uses the stack of money to light the fire, 
a symbol of him leaving the redneck criminal behind him for good. It's worthless, this house with its ghosts and its condemnations. It doesn't define him, it doesn't own him. All he has to do is walk away. And for the first time, his psychological load lightened, we see Daryl smirk as they walk away. In the next episode, we see a brand new Daryl we've never seen before. He holds hands and gives serious piggybacks. He wraps ankles and carries you to brunch. Beth continues to teach Daryl about the goodness in the world, and he starts to give people the benefit of the doubt. This is probably the single most important moment of their time together. If there's a moment where Daryl is overwhelmed by the beauty and hope that Beth represents, it's right here. Perhaps in this moment, he's even falling in love with her. The song Beth is singing is about not labeling feelings, about just being with someone else because it gets messed up as soon as you call it something else. You don't wanna be my boyfriend And that's probably for the best Cause that, that gets messy And you will hurt me Or I'll disappear The lyrics tell us that they aren't going to call themselves boyfriend and girlfriend, although that's clearly what they are. It's after this scene that Daryl decides that maybe they don't need to look for other people, that maybe Beth is enough for him. The one-eyed stray dog wants to take a chance at coming into the house. What changed your mind? But of course, Daryl is never allowed to keep anything he loves, and she's ripped from his grasp. Oh. Good writers leave clues in their work, like pieces of a puzzle for the reader or audience to put together. The Walking Dead is no different. This isn't Sharknado, it's Lord of the Flies. By imposing meaning on the symbols in the work, the writer can communicate subtext without the character having to pedantically explain it. A good example of this is Daryl's crossbow. It comes to represent Daryl's strength and his inexhaustible ability to survive. If someone takes it, he takes it back. He hunts for food with it, not just for himself but for the whole group. He protects himself and the group from walkers and human enemies with it. It is his strength, his superpower. As he becomes more established in the group, his crossbow is upgraded and his bolts replenished. But when he loses Beth, he runs all night until he is literally at a crossroad. He stands, exhausted, unsure, and without the one person he has left from his new family and the one person who made him feel emotionally complete. Spent, he drops the crossbow and falls to the ground. He's done. After the prison fell, he was in pure survival mode, but Beth dragged him out of it. With Beth gone, Daryl is lifeless. When Joe and his band of criminals shows up, Daryl must choose a path to survive or melt away. Well, look at here. And when Joe makes a move for Daryl's crossbow, Daryl takes a swing from the ground, practically a signature move at this point, and chooses survival yet again. I know this was your doing, Kirkman. God sees you. God sees you. Take the death of Sophia and times it by about a billion, and that's what the death of Beth means to Daryl. It's the death of goodness and hope. The world has broken trust with him, and it takes all that he is not to revert back to redneck Daryl. He emerges out the other side of this darker and more fiercely independent. The fact that he takes out his gun and shoots Don point-blank in the head is a really big deal. Up until this point, Daryl has killed exactly five people. Dale, two soldiers in a firefight at Woodbury, Tank Douche with his crossbow, and Claimer Minion by stomping on his face. That's only one more than Carl and Lizzie. Other than Dale, which was an act of kindness, these were all directly self-defense. Psychologically, this is a really big shift for him to have performed this act. The Walking Dead draws a line between people who are clinging to a sense of humanity and people who are willing to do whatever it takes to survive. We see this when Rick's group is killing the Terminus crew. Glenn and Maggie are hanging back and watching in horror while Rick, Michonne, Sasha and Abraham brutally murder the termites. You'll notice that Daryl wasn't there. He was off looking for Beth. 
That's on purpose. Daryl would not have been able to slaughter those people like that. But Beth's death pushes Daryl one step closer to this point. He becomes much more closed off and untrusting. He is distant within the group and more dead inside overall. So I hope you like the deep dive into the character evolution of Daryl Dixon. Be sure to watch part six where I talk about the second half of season five. Please let me know your questions and comments. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Twitter. Until next time, don't look back.